stars of animation are shining. It's time to stay tuned. And now, here's your host, Phil Mackey. Greetings one and all and welcome to the show. Tonight's special guest is Ron Diamond. For 20 years now, the animation show of shows has presented the finest short films from the animation community to excited international audiences. These shorts are collected from all over the world by curator and Acme Filmworks founder Ron Diamond. This traveling celebration of the medium now makes its way to Austin, Texas, tomorrow, August 17th. Alamo Drafthouse will be showing the show of shows for a limited four-day engagement, and Ron Diamond is here to tell us all about this unique festival in just a few moments. But first, this. Ron Diamond, welcome to Stay Tuned. Thank you so much for having me, Phil. Yeah, it is my pleasure to have you here. You've got a very exciting anniversary that you're kind of in the middle of celebrating right now. The animation show of shows, 20th year. It's been a long run, and uh, <laughs> I was there for the first one, and I'm here for the 20th one, and all of them in between. Well, there's not many people that can say that about something that has gone on as long as it as the show has. I think there's a very small handful of people who actually have seen all of them. Well, and then you've seen, obviously, even more than that, because you have to choose what makes it into this presentation, right? That's correct. As a matter of fact, I look at nearly a thousand films every year. Oh, wow. That's a lot of films. I have to tell you that many of them are very good, and some of them are great, and then some are worthy of the show. I imagine that numbs you a bit to repeat themes and probably makes you want to watch the more bizarre stuff. Yes, unquestionably, but not bizarre for bizarre sake. I really like to have films that have a personality, that tell us something about the filmmaker as much as the narrative that they're telling us that are rich and, um, you know, artful. They got to be interesting to look at but I want them to be very appealing for the audience to experience. So how do you go about choosing like which films make the cut? Well, I got a very big, very, very big folder called Nope. Um, (laughs) Then I have a very small folder called Maybe. And then the absolutely folder usually immediately only has one or two films. So I I just have to kind of narrow it down. And uh, I rarely... I will. I'll, I'll, I won't go back to the note pile ever. Oh, you know. But the maybe one you give that. No, I definitely. I need to go to the maybe pile. Those are the ones that are kind of like, well, they capture my interest and they're interesting, and I, they they definitely need to be looked at at least one or two more times before I make a decision whether I want to pursue that film. And then sometimes I don't get the films I want, which is kind of frustrating. But that's, you don't get the rights to them. You mean? That's correct, because this is a commercial venture. Different people have other commitments or they, uh, they don't want to have their films uh, you know, restricted from internet use, which is a big issue. A lot of people want to put their oh. films immediately on Vimeo. They see that uh, moniker of staff pick as the most important thing that they can hope to have. So you're saying these are not films necessarily that were all submitted to you. These are films that you're finding and then you reach out to the individuals and say, would you like to be a part of this? Exactly. Most of the films that I look at, I don't pursue the filmmakers. We do look at a lot of film festival films, and I go to many festivals, generally between two and six festivals a year. So that's a lot of festivals. But the one thing I've learned is not every festival is going to have every film. And certainly films that are selected in competition are of great interest. So often we pursue those films. So when a film shows up and it's been selected for one of, say, about 150 festivals that I'm interested in, then, you know, I'll usually reach out and say, hey, can I take a look at your film? And sometimes I get a response and sometimes I get no response. And maybe that's because I have the wrong email address or whatever. So I'm always looking for new films. But please, that doesn't mean that I don't want people to submit their films to me. I do. Okay. Is there a specific 
cutoff point that you feel you need to adhere to, like a, a time stamp for the entire length of the presentation? I don't want any more than 15. Or, or if you had one really long one that was like half an hour long, but you really wanted it in there, is there are there cutoff points? It's been a long time since I've had films over 15 minutes or 16 minutes in the show. I have had some films that have gone 30 minutes way in the early days when it was strictly shown to uh, colleges and to the studios. You see, the animation show show started out with an idea of bringing sort of the best of what festivals were offering to the studios. I felt that they weren't seeing the creative work that I was seeing at festivals. And so I reached out uh, initially to a handful of studios and I said, you want to look at one film? This was the precursor to the show of shows. I said, sure, bring it on over. I said, I got the filmmaker and they said, even better. And we got, and that film got, was nominated for an Oscar. And then the following year, we had four films in the show. It's really now, because it's intended for a theatrical audience as much as it is for studios and schools, the goal is to make sure that we have it in uh, the 90 to 98 minute range. After that, it just gets to be a long program. And as much as I love many of the films and really would like to include them, at some point, you really want to make sure that that sit down experience is compact enough that somebody could walk out and go, wow, that was amazing. Sure. Uh, but I do try to always include at least one experimental film in the program. Gender biasing really doesn't come to play. Probably about 50% of the films are made by women uh, or 50% mm. of the films are made by men. Um, <laughs> I've been looking for a really good uh, trans film. Uh, I just think there are subjects that are really important to bring to the light of public audiences. And I've seen films. I've seen good films, but I haven't yet seen phenomenal films in that area. Hmm. You know, I, I really want to set a very high standard. So we deal with a lot of other uh, socially related issues in the context of the show. And then just a lot of fun films, you know, as well. But even, even the films that are dealing with subjects that are heavy are generally interesting and compelling and uh, thought provoking and in many cases fun to look at as well. Is there an overall theme each year? that you kind of like say, this is the year where we're going to talk about outer space. The minute I do that, that means that I have gotten away from the original idea behind the show of shows. And that is to present films that are new, relatively new. Okay. You know, with our 19th show, I put in a couple older films, a film from 1963, which we restored from history. It had never been seen in a movie theater. It had only been shown in the... Uh, non-theatrical educational circuit. I saw it as a child myself in the mid-60s. Uh, and I showed Pete Doctor's student film, which I felt supported nice. the theme in that particular show. But generally, I do not look for a theme within the context of the show. I don't start with a theme. I look for a theme after I put the show together because themes are what the critics like to hold on to. They're like, okay, you've given me something to write about. Uh, not just a bunch of films, but there is kind of something overriding. And when they have that, then it, it's easier for them to focus on the concept of the show. Yeah, I could, I could see that. I could see how that gives them a little bit of an angle to discuss, you know, a hook. to promote a hook. Yeah. So you said we restored a moment ago. We meaning Acme Filmworks? No, we, the animation show shows. I, I do most of the work with the show shows, though I usually have one or two people that are employees here. And in addition to that, I have board members who contribute their time, like a lawyer, an accountant, people like that. But uh, myself and the filmmaker, uh, or the daughter of the filmmakers, uh, the two daughters of the two filmmakers, of Paul Julian and uh, Les Goldman, they both gave ben very generously of their time, uh, their knowledge, they shared materials that they found. Some were remarkable and some that went nowhere. I love the preservation that's being achieved here. Um, in the past, we've learned of terrible fires that destroy studio originals sometimes. And as a general rule, I think like we're lacking as far as preserving our art is concerned. So I really do like what you're doing here as far as bringing awareness and also a sense of culture. Well, it's, um, uh, it's costly. Thankfully, we've gotten grants from uh, the National Film Preservation Foundation and the CIPA Hollywood, both who supported our efforts with Hangman. Uh, we went uh, six years planning to finish with an interpositive. It's a copy of the negative that's usually made for safety purposes. And one day I was talking to the director, uh, Paul Julian's daughter, Allison, who's a marvelous individual. And I said, I know it's the hundredth time I'm asking, but 
let's just talk about maybe you know where that negative is. She says, no, really, I don't. And I said, well, let's just (laughs) think about it. Imagine a metal can with the word hangman written on a very thin, maybe a three-eighths of an inch wide piece of tape, white tape, and it just says hangman on it. Let's just think about that. And she goes, no, no. (laughs) And then she says, but, and I'm going, but... We've been talking about this for six years, and now you're going to throw a button there? It's like, yeah, my sister's got some old film prints in her basement in Spokane, Washington. Oh. Guess what was there? Hangman. Camera original negative. Wow. Yeah, That's pretty incredible. Yes. They thought it was an old film print, but in fact, it was the negative. So that right there really, that tells you, because, you know, we've been hearing about all of a sudden people are finding copies of old Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoons. And, you know, when I first read about that, I was like, how are people just now finding this stuff? But you just explained it. That's exactly how it's. People forget. They don't even know. They don't even know. They thought it was an old film print. Right. Right. Check your attics, everybody. (laughs) Check those attics. Uh, (laughs) Ron, do you do you have an animation background yourself? I started in the 80s. Um, I finished. Hey, the- I started in the 80s. Wait, wait, I, no, wait a minute. You started in the 80s. I, started I literally, I literally started exactly. in the 80s. <laughs> yes. um, I went to film school at UCLA. I studied film. I uh, was focused entirely on producing live action movies. I produced three feature films. Uh, but while I was in film school, I had two uh, things that brought me to animation. One was I took a great animation class, the basic first you know, animation 101. I did lots of little animation tests. I made a little 15 second film. Uh, I learned a lot about the history of animation. And concurrently with that, my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, we've been together 40 years uh, or nearly 40 years. We started a distribution company because we were seeing all these student films and nobody was doing anything with them. I mean, literally there was no internet. There was no very little distribution. Uh, Cable TV was burgeoning. And when I mean burgeoning, HBO was maybe three years old at the time. Oh, wow. They were looking to short films as a way of filling time. Mm -hmm. They hadn't yet risen to being called interstitials. Right. They were just called fillers. And there was a distributor in New York whose entire library of short films was organized based on runtime. That was pretty much it. It was like, do you need a two minute, a two and a half minute or a three minute or a four minute film just to fill those gaps? And so um, we started this distribution company and we were distributing the films of Mark Baker, who then uh, most recently created Peppa Pig. Another young filmmaker had just won a student Academy Award for his student film, a guy named John Lasseter, uh, had made (laughs) a film called Lady and the Lamp, which we distributed. And we built the library of about 150 films. In 1985, we sold our business to Expanded Entertainment, which was partnered with Landmark Theaters. And they had just acquired the rights to the international tournée of animation. And so I produced um, several of the tournées of animation, 19 through the 23rd. And then I worked on the animation celebration and outrageous animation, all these collections of animation that went automatically into movie theaters and did very, very well. Hmm. So in creating the show shows, I kind of followed a lot of that path in terms of films, though I put more emphasis on really films that had strong merits as opposed to just funny haha films. The other thing that I did that really differentiated it with both the 17 and 18 and now with the 21st upcoming edition, we've produced documentaries with the filmmakers. They're short. They're about three minutes long. And it's kind of like, why this narrative? Why this filmmaker? Why now? That's great. And we realized that there's some pretty big themes that are underwriting uh, these films that are really important. And when you see that, then you really get moved by it. Sure. It provides some necessary context to the audience. Yeah. yeah. So I, kind of, I refer to that as kind of the glue that holds it all together. Well, it's quite a history you've got. Yes. And then I did a movie called The Dark Backward. What? Yes. Yes. The Dark Backward with... Uh... I happen to love that movie and I, no one I know knows about it. Well, you know me and uh, Dave Watson, who's a friend and director that I've worked with for many years. He is a huge fan of that. I also know the art director that made the cool billboard things that were in the background. Of that. Yeah. Yeah. We. It was fun. It was a very... And I worked with Adam Rifkin, the director, and I adore him. And we've remained very close ever since. Hey, well, find a way to make that film come to Blu-ray so it can get restored. Oh, and yeah. That would be appreciated. Nice. You know, we worked with Bill Paxton, and he was such a 
a kind and wonderful fellow, and I've had many interactions with him during his career, and we all miss him terribly. Man, yeah, um, that's true. Yeah. Man, the dark backward. I haven't heard that in a while. So, <laughs> But that, that dovetailed into the start of Acme Filmworks, and that I've run now for 30 years, and that's uh, about 10 years into it, I decided that I was just seeing all these great films because that's where I was looking for new directors. Again, all before YouTube. Yeah. The best way to find new directors was to actually go to festivals and meet them. And what is Acme Filmworks in a nutshell? In a nutshell, a boutique animation studio that's focused on bringing opportunity to directors who have unique visions for animation. And so we identify people who have both unique artistic vision as well as people who have a desire to work within that space. I mean, 30 seconds is a challenge, but animators generally uh, like to work in a box. Put me in a box, I'll find my way out, you know, and yeah. I'll work with what I've got. Yeah, that's true. More with Ron Diamond after this. What animated films sparked your love for the medium? Well, many films did. I mean, initially, the first film that caught my attention was the film by John F. Faith Hubley, and that's Windy Day. Uh, as far as independent goes. When I was a kid, of course, I loved the Looney Tunes. Yeah. Uh, John F. Faith Hubley's film was the first film that whetted my, my interest, my awareness that something unusual could happen in animation. You know, that Windy Day used an original audio recording that John Hubley had recorded of his children just playing. And then he cut that down and then animated it. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to do a play about Princess Polly and Prince Joel. Princess Polly is acted by Georgia. Don't make faces. <laughs> Prince Joel is acted by Emily. Ha 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 ha. Prince will go ha 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 ha. And Daddy will go hoo 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 hoo. <laughs> Later on, I would say the most important film. Uh, for me that has kind of fueled me all of these years is the film The Man Who Planted Trees, which is not a film I distributed uh, as part of the show of shows officially. It's on our DVD collection, and it presupposes the idea that if this man who transforms a landscape by virtue of literally just doing a small act every day. And it's something that, although it's entirely fictional, we can all recognize as something that's entirely feasible. And in his case, he plants 100 acorns every day. And he transforms a landscape into a verdant, full, lively. He brings nature back to an otherwise desolate area of the southern part of France. That's beautiful. It's so compelling. When I think that one man, one body, and one spirit was enough to turn a desert into the land of Canaan, I find, after all, that a man's destiny can be truly wonderful. But when I consider the passionate determination, the unfailing generosity of spirit it took to achieve this end, I'm filled with admiration for this old, unlearned peasant who was able to complete a task worthy of God. I was friends with Frederick Bach for many, many years, from the time I was distributing the film up until his passing a few years ago. And we remastered his other film that was not that won the Academy Award Crack. I had the pleasure of showing that to him a few months before he passed away, and he, he oh, was wow. so happy with it. It was the first, and to my knowledge, currently the only HD version of it uh, that exists. And we color corrected scene by scene. That's amazing! What a gift back to him. You know, he was a very kind man. He was a very gifted artist, extremely humble, and very devoted to his art form. Hmm. And to think that he made The Man of Planet Trees in all of about eight years. 30-minute film, won him the Academy Award, and well-deserved. To me, that's why I'm out there, is to spread the good word. Has anybody ever compared what you're doing with the animation show of shows to the original intention behind Fantasia? Because that's kind of what you're doing in the sense that Fantasia was supposed to be this perennial collection of films that they would swap one or two out of and it would always be this rotating thing. And not that you're keeping a couple of films always in there, but in a manner of speaking, you're actually achieving that. 
It's an interesting uh, correlation that you raise, and I have to say nobody has actually mentioned it in all these years. Well, yeah. you heard it here first, folks. I heard it here first. Phil, <laughs> you were the enlightened one. Um, I did uh, share the films with uh, Roy Disney. Mm. Uh, one time when showing it at Walt Disney Studios, I ran into him in the hallway and I said, hey, we're screening my program. I mean, I had casually met him previously. And uh, he said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll catch it. And then I said, well, are you, if you got anything to do after lunch and if you'd like to join us, that'd be really nice. And I had Adam Elliott, who ended up winning the Oscar later on, hmm. months later for his film, Harvey Crumpet. And uh, the executive who was walking us around the studio was going, I've never met him. I've never spoken with him. And I'm going to have lunch with him. It's like, yeah, I'm just invite, you know. So anyway, we had a lovely lunch together. And every year I organize a special tour for the films to play at the studios. I try to do it within a two-week window. So the filmmakers whose films are in the show, uh, if they can afford the cost of coming to Los Angeles and the time, which is usually a bigger issue, they come and they join me. And I'll drive them around and we'll go from place to place to place to place. And whether it's Disney or Pixar, or DreamWorks, Sony, you know, ILM, pretty much all the studios, a number of universities, uh, the Animation Society, ASIFA. And uh, it's usually two or three showings a day. It's a marvelous opportunity for filmmakers before the Oscars being talked about to have a chance to share their work and to be in the company of their peers, who even though they may be making big Hollywood feature films, they know how hard it is to make a really successful short film. Yeah. Obviously, you know, like you hear from parents, you don't want to choose your favorite child. <laughs> but of the 15 short films presented this year, is there one or two that you feel best encompasses the 20th anniversary of the animation show of shows? Hmm. That's a good question. I should find a list of what I have in the show. The best way to answer is to take a light and put it over your head and, and make sure it's beating down on you so that you can feel like you're under the pressure of that question. Yeah, I do feel under the pressure of that question. Let's see here. You know, <laughs> I, I just need a cheat sheet here so I can uh, remember. Okay, well, that's the 21st. I recognized a couple of the names from the most recent Oscars. Yes, of course. You had Weekends yep. and you had uh, One Small Step, yep. both of which are really extraordinary films. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had the pleasure of just showing One Small Step at uh, Comic-Con, which was oh, great. fantastic. You know? Yeah. One Small Step is great. It really is. Yeah. You know, it's very hard to pick one film out. I mean, for instance, the film that opens the show is a student film. It's called The Green Bird, and it's truly one of my favorite films in the show. I try to start the show off with a really strong selection of films. You know, this is an unusual show because we have such an amazing mix. The first two films, new films from CalArts in the program, both Polaris, which was done by a young Japanese director uh, who had moved to America to just go to CalArts. And uh, before she graduated, she was already invited to work with Glenn Keane in the story department on his new feature film. Hmm. How's that for a graduation present? I mean, that's, yeah, you don't get much more to the top than that. No, you really don't. It's, it's so extraordinary to have that kind of prime opportunity. It's really unusual. And then the other film was uh, by a young woman from uh, Taiwan, uh, and that's a film called Barry which is a very funny film, but highly relatable about this character who wants to be successful as a doctor, but has one small thing going against him. And that is that this character is a goat. Oh, well, yes, that would prove a problem. It would prove to be a problem. It shouldn't be a problem, but in fact, it is a problem. Yeah. And that inherently is a, a real challenge uh, for Barry because the administration says, well, goats can't be doctors. Well, Barry, you know, uh, comes up with a cure for cancer and still uh, manages, uh, finally gets back into the hospital uh, to prove that he's capable of something very, very important. Hmm. I like that. And we have this problem right now in America about people not being invited into the United States. Oh, I was going to say we have a problem with goats trying to be doctors? Exactly. Well, we do have a problem with that. It's a, it's a rampant problem with goats yeah. and doctors. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's, it makes us look twice at the fact that we might be restricting. Sure. Well, it's a brilliant premise, too, because if you were to ask somebody on the street, could a goat be a doctor? The instinctual answer is, well, of course not. This filmmaker chose an absolute statement of, of course that couldn't happen. And then it forces you to go, well, maybe it could. 
maybe it could. So, you know, there's a lot of poetry within this year's show. So inclusion, you could say maybe is the theme this year. Yes, it is a strong theme. Okay. It's a very strong. That's a great theme to choose. What's the best way people can support the animation show of shows, particularly if it's not coming to a city near them? Well, soon we'll be offering a screener link where people will be able to watch past shows on a time limited basis, and therefore they can contribute to be able to do that. And probably the best immediate thing for them to do is to um, get on our mailing list. And that's to visit animationshowofshows.com. We have a donate page and they can certainly contribute anytime they want to what we're doing. And they can buy DVDs too? And they can buy DVDs of past shows. That's fantastic. And Stay Tuned is produced in Austin, Texas, which brings me to my next statement of the animation show of shows will be in Austin, Texas yes. on the 17th through the 20th. Is that right? That's correct. And that's, that's very correct. exciting because uh, that means in a city near me, in fact, the city that I live in, I can just go to the Alamo Draft House Theater, which is uh, this location would be the South Lamar location. That's correct. Uh, I wish I could go to all of the places. Uh, we, we played in Egypt in Tahrir Square at the famous Zawa Cinema, which is known going back to the 1930s as one of the most important art house cinemas in the world. And people were paying admission of $1.90. And we were making 50% of that. So for 95 cents for 80 people, you know, it just I couldn't be there. Yeah. Uh, but I reached out to a lot of people in Egypt. I became friends with a lot of animators in Egypt during that time. Wow. You know, the more people who sign up on our mailing list, that's the best way for us to be able to reach you. And once we get to a point of critical mass, meaning if we start to get literally thousands of people showing up, uh, right now I think all told we have less than 200 tickets to sell for the four showings that we have in South Lamar. Definitely, hopefully we'll fill the room. And once we do, that means that they'll give us more days for either this show or the upcoming show. And that's how it works in distribution. If you show that it's successful and people actually leave their homes uh, with their kids and their families, then they will support it and the theater will recognize that and they will continue to add more dates. And that's a good thing. So that's the big challenge behind distribution. There you go. That's the classic challenge. And I certainly hope you guys hit your goal because... It means a wider uh, selection of cities will be able to showcase these amazing films. I am delighted to be in Austin. And we have been in, uh, with the 19th show, we were in over 80 cities across North America. Oh, wow. In movie theaters. And we were in over 50 universities. And we're programming more universities as we go. Every day we try to get out to more and more universities. So anybody listening to this, Regardless to wherever you are in the world, we can play at your university. Well, may I suggest Bowling Green State University in Ohio, which is my alma mater. The best way to make this kind of thing happen is send an email to somebody at Bowling uh, Green and uh, make contact and have them say, yes, we would love that, and then introduce me. And then we'll make it happen. There you um, go. We, we play in Truro, Nova Scotia, and we play in uh, Bulgaria. And a number of different colleges where I, on Skype, will get on and chat with the students and talk about the films. That's great. In some cases, the schools pay for me to fly out. Oh, how and nice. in that case, I'm able to do that. So yeah. uh, next month, I'll be in Augusta, Georgia. Oh, not Soviet Georgia. I'm going to be in Soviet Georgia in October. Oh, you are? I am, both. Oh, <laughs> well, there actually, you go. I'm going to do a, a, a speech <laughs> at, an, at a conference a distribution uh, in Soviet Georgia organized by the, uh, the Georgian film community. I've been to Georgia. I went to an animation festival held in a church. It was such a, a sweet festival. No tickets, nobody there at the door. You just walk in and watch short films. And it was a great fest. And we were, it was organized by priests of this church. Well, you know, just like church and just like films, the objective is butts and seats. It is, uh, and, and if you could be watching animation in church, all the better. <laughs> That's right. Two great tastes that taste great together. Absolutely. Well, Ron, thank you so much for being here. This was um, a, a truly insightful look into something that I think a lot of people probably didn't know was even happening, which is, which is sad to me because it's been going around for 20 years. And uh, I hope now that this gives uh, folks a chance to go and discover the DVDs from the previous years 
and maybe even get out of their own house to uh, come to South Lamar and check out the 20th anniversary of this incredible collection of short films. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I would just encourage anybody who believes in what they see to be extremely vocal and encourage other people to come and see it. Because there are a lot of cities where we play and you'd be surprised. I say, who knows somebody in Cincinnati? And, you know, to an audience and 50 people raise their hands. Well, depending on the size of the room, there may be only three people. But it's kind of like, well, tell those friends of yours, go see it in Cincinnati. It's very impressive if there's 50 hands in a, in a room of three people. That's, that <laughs> raises all kinds of questions and sparks an animated film already in my mind, actually. <laughs> Just random hands appearing out of the ether. I'll be looking but, for that one. Oh, good. Well, thanks again, Ron. Thank you so much, Phil. I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. We'll we look forward to seeing the, uh, the collection here uh, very shortly. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye. That selection of music was from the 1981 Frederick Bach animated short film, Crack. The film's music was by Normand Roger, a Canadian composer whose animation career includes short films like The Man Who Planted Trees, The Old Man and the Sea, and the opening and closing titles for the television series, Mystery. Okay, folks, that brings us to the end of this episode. Special thanks go out once again to Ron Diamond for joining us here on the show. And, of course, thank you so much for listening in at home. As a reminder, if you're in Austin this weekend, come on out to the Alamo Draft House on South Lamar for the 20th Annual Animation Show of Shows. You have four days to choose from, but I should point out that tomorrow, August 17th, I will be hosting the presentation in person. The fun starts at 11.30 a.m. Saturday morning, and you can find additional information and ticket sales at drafthouse.com forward slash Austin. To go behind the scenes with Stay Tuned, head on over to patreon.com forward slash philmaki. Subscribing there will get you access to cool rewards like exclusive interview outtakes, my cartoon reviews, and monthly video updates. While you're at it, check out my original comic books at RetailSunshine.com and reach out to me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook under the handles of both Retail Sunshine and Phil Maki. Don't forget to visit the amazing Stay Tuned community on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Stay Tuners. I've been Phil Maki, you've been a wonderful audience, and until next time, keep those eyeballs peeled, those ears open, and be sure to stay tuned.